Okay, so today's stuff. Um, we may not have that, I may not lecture the, the entire time depending on how my voice holds up. Um, today we're jumping ahead, let's see, Epictetus to Anselm, we're jumping ahead about a millennium. So we're skipping over a lot of stuff in, in the history of philosophy. And, you know, there are some people that would have been really good for us to study um, had we more time and, uh, you know, the capacity to focus in on all these different things. But we have to make some selections. And <clears throat> so we didn't read somebody like St. Saint, Saint Augustine, another great uh, religious thinker. We are going to read Anselm, and we're going to read the third A, uh, Thomas Aquinas, um, starting, I think, next week, right after we finish with, with Anselm. But I want to tell you a little bit about Anselm, since we're making this big jump, we're, we're kind of shifting gears. I want to tell you a little bit about Anselm and, and then what we're doing with this, this class. Um, so this guy, Anselm, he was a monk. Um, what do monks do? They, they wear different clothes, right? They're like nuns. Nun, nun is the female equivalent of monk. Um, what sets them apart from other people? Other than wearing strange clothes. Yeah. They can't get married. They can't get married. That, that's the, an important point. Um, why not? Yeah. Does not to do with something like they're technically married to God? Yeah, often, to, you're, you're right, oftentimes they, they frame it in terms of, well, I can't get married, but that's okay, because I'm married to God, and, and I'm married to Jesus, or, you know. Um, but, you know, it's not, monasticism is not just found in Christianity. You also have um, Islamic um, mystics, the Sufis. You have um, Hindu and Buddhist monks, different different people who go off. And, what, are they, what are they doing? Um, what's their life about? Anyone, have, anyone know offhand? This is an area where there's actually a lot of monasteries and, and seminaries and nunneries. I think that's what you call them. Um, what, are the, what are those people about? I, 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 I'm guessing, <laughs> since none of you know, that none of you were attracted to that sort of life. Um, the word monk, it comes from Greek, and it comes from the word monikos, which means alone. <clears throat> Originally, these were people who went off in the desert by themselves. And why do you think somebody would go off in the desert by themselves? Because they like the, the scenery, or they can't stand their fellow co-workers. That could be a reason, right? People get away. Why else? In the beginning of the Christian era, why do these people go off in the desert all by themselves? Any ideas? Just take guesses. Avoid the Roman soldiers. That could be a reason. It wasn't the reason. What was it? Yeah. To see if they could see if they could do it, see if they could handle it, sort of like a boot camp. Um, and some of the things that they did were pretty hardcore, tough stuff. You know, a lot of fasting, vigils, um, you know, uh, trying to purify themselves. But why? Yeah. To their life to prayer and to God. Yeah, that's what, that's what monasticism was about. It was withdrawing from other things so that they could devote themselves to, to prayer. Uh, and prayer is a communication. Right? It's not... It's not just going off and, and mumbling to yourself. Um, it's, it's supposed to be some sort of communication with something divine, right? And so in all the different world religions, when people go off and become monastics, whether they're male or female, monks or nuns, <clears throat> they're going off and they're, they're withdrawing from ordinary secular life to try to live a more uh, religious life, a more sacred life. And Anselm was one of those guys. Um, he wanted to do that when he was pretty young. Um, the reason why we've got these different names for him, Anselm of Canterbury or Beck or Aosta, Aosta is where he came from. It's now in Italy. It was part of the kingdom at that time called Burgundy. And we get Burgundy wine from, 
from that, right? Uh, and, and that part of Burgundy is part of Italy now. So if you're an Italian, you call him Anselm d'Aosta because you want to claim him as, as your guy. Um, if you're French, then you focus on where the monastery that he lived at, which is called Bec, which is in Normandy. Um, so you call him Anselm de Bec. And if you're English, if you're an English speaker like us, then you call him Anselm of Canterbury, because that's where he wound up and, and actually lived out a good portion of his, his life. So Anselm wanted to become a monk, and he uh, was a pretty successful monk. You know, what would success be as a monk? It would be, presumably, you know, making a lot of money, becoming the abbot, that, you know, wealth, power, we talked about these before. Um, having lots of friends and influencing people? No. Understanding God. That's what, that's what he was interested in. Um, that's what monks were supposed to be interested in. It, does it actually work that way for, <coughs> for all monks and nuns? Never did. Um, there are always some people in it for the wrong reasons. And, and actually, if you look at Anselm's letters, you find as he actually became a, an abbot and then a, a bishop, he had to discipline people who were in it for the wrong reasons. And he'd have to say, ah, you're not supposed to be doing this, you're not supposed to be getting drunk, you're not supposed to be out, out on the town with the women, um, you know, all sorts of things along those lines. But Anselm himself was very much interested in learning as much as he could. At that time, if you wanted to go to school, one of the places to do it was a monastery, because that was one of the few places where people were on the, on the whole, educated. Monasteries were, were the places where Western literature was saved. And one of the things that these monks would do was they would copy books by hand. So a lot of the books that we have um, came to us because of monks, not because they felt like doing it or they wanted it. It was a religious duty, copying these things out by hand. And if you do that sort of thing, you guys know this from taking you know, somebody else's notes and copying them, you learn a lot in the process, don't you? So <coughs> it's a way to become quite educated. So Anselm goes to Beck. He's not yet a monk. And he starts studying with this guy, Lanfranc, who used to be a lawyer, uh, and then decided he, he didn't want to be a lawyer anymore, and he became a monk. And then Anselm kind of thought about things, and. And he decided he had what we call a religious vocation. He wanted to become a monk. And, and like you said, set himself apart so he could engage in prayer and, and get closer to God. By this time, they're no longer in the desert. This is, you know, out in the, the just the, you know, the countryside. And Anselm, you know, stays at his monastery. He... Um, he eventually becomes the prior, sort of like the second in command, and then when the abbot dies, they elect him the abbot. Um, he did not like that. He was the kind of guy, he's sort of a typical academic. He wanted to study the things that he wanted to study, and he didn't want to exercise responsibility. You know, if you, you guys will, will learn this as you get older. Some of you have probably already been in, in um, uh, roles where you had some responsibility. Right? Like, uh, you're, forget what you forget, yeah, student uh, council, right? You had some responsibility. This isn't my subject. It's not your focus. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you didn't then. Um, but as you get older, you, you find out the more things you get responsible for, the less you can actually do that you want to do. What Anselm wanted to do was to think about philosophy and theology and about God. And... They kept on, uh, because he was a smart guy and because he was honest, they kept on giving him more and more and more responsibility. Eventually, he goes to England, and while he's in England, the king actually uh, makes him archbishop. And he was so against being archbishop, they had to, they had to actually force the, the uh, what is the thing they call the, the, the staff that the bishop has? I forget the, the name of it. But you all know, you know it's got the circular thing. They had to force it. In, what's it? Is it like a sickle or something? No, it's not a sickle. Crozier? Is it called, maybe? They had to force it into his hand. They had to drag him to the cathedral. They gave him a bloody nose in the process. That's how much this guy didn't want to be in charge of things. And yet he, uh, he stayed in charge the rest of his life. And then the king actually changed his mind when he found out Anselm wasn't going to do what he wanted him to do. And there was a, a lot of church state stuff. 
Now, one of the things that Anselm is particularly known for in the history of philosophy is a certain kind of argument. Uh, an ontological, that's what we call this kind of argument since the time of, of Kant, somebody you're going to read later in the semester. An ontological argument for God's existence. Um, he's, he's famous for a lot of other things too, but we're going to focus on that. And you find this ontological argument in Proslogion, which is one of the many books that he wrote. Proslogion is the one that we are going to read this semester. And I'm going to talk in a couple minutes about you know, what Proslogion means and you know, how to read it and, and that sort of thing. Um, but for first I want to think about this for a minute. So you've got a monk, right? Do monks generally believe in God? And he is coming up with an argument for God's existence. Why would he do that? What, do you, what good would that do, you think? When do you come up with arguments for things? When you don't believe in something like this. Say it a little bit louder. When you don't believe in something. When you don't believe in something, yeah, sometimes you, like if you didn't believe in God, you might want to come up with an argument against God's existence, right? Um, who would you make an argument about God's existence to? Those who don't believe in Yeah. Now, were there a lot of people who didn't believe in God in the Middle Ages? Some, but not too many, right? That was the age of faith, wasn't it? As we, as we tell everybody in the history classes. You know who he actually wrote this to? He wrote this to his fellow monks. What do you think is, is going on there? His, his monks, you know, the other monks, presumably they believe in God, right? Otherwise, why are they sitting around the monastery, not, you know, going out and getting married and wearing these, you know, uncomfortable garments and, and doing all this work and listening to, you know, somebody tell them what to do? Um... Well, that's something to think about. Why, why is he trying to come up with an idea, an, an idea like a, a proof for the existence of God? Um, why do theologians do this sort of thing? It, you know, you could, if you want to be joking about this, you could say, so Dr. Sadler could give a lecture about it, you know, uh, 800 years later or something like that. Actually, 900 years later. Um, Anselm's celebration of Anselm's 900-year anniversary of his death was just a couple of years ago. Um, but that's not the reason. So why, why do people do this? Well, they want to know, first of all, whether you can do it. There's, there's intellectual curiosity there. Remember we talked about metaphysics with Aristotle a little while back? And we talked about all these different arts and sciences and why people do them. You know, for instance, why do people figure out how to make coffee well, because we like the taste of coffee, right? So that barista behind uh, the counter at Starbucks who's taken some, you know, course on coffee, whatever, I forget what they call it. They, they have to take some sort of coffee-making course. They, they really do at Starbucks. Uh, coffee culture or something. Uh, <coughs> they're learning a useful art, right? The person who works on my cell phone when my cell phone breaks down, there's a reason for that. It's a useful art. They're going to make it work for me. And why do I need this cell phone? Well, to call people, to check my email, surf the web, that sort of stuff. Be a sta you know, carried around, look, you know, look cool when they were originally cool. Um, what about metaphysics? Why do we do metaphysics? Do we do it because it provides us any sort of tangible good like that? What good have you gotten out of studying metaphysics so far? Has it made you wealthy? Healthier? Have you gotten anything out of studying metaphysics this semester? <laughs> you can be honest. It was just think. Makes you think, okay. And is, is that a pleasurable thing or is that an unpleasant thing? Or? But again, you can be honest with me. I don't, I'm, I've been teaching required uh, philosophy classes my entire career. So nothing that students can say to me about, oh, this class is terrible, 
I, I wish I never had to do this. I'm never going to study this again. Doesn't hurt my feelings at all. That that could be the case. Is that is that the case with anybody? No. I'm I'm very surprised if it's not. On the other hand, there's some people who took this class, and they'd never read Plato before. And after this class is finished, uh, probably not you know right after the, the, the semester, but later on in their career, they're going to study Plato again. And you know why? Why? Why are they going to go back to Plato? Or Aristotle? Or Epictetus? Or Anselm? Because they found something there that made them think, that got its hooks into them, that maybe it even you know, gave them a headache. Um, but somehow it, it aroused their curiosity. Maybe it gave them a certain sort of pleasure. People like to think about things, right? We don't all like to think about exactly the same thing. But we do like to think about things. Like Aristotle said, all people desire to know. We want to know the causes for things. So for some of you, St. Anselm and his ontological argument is going to be something that you would actually enjoy thinking about more and more after this class is finished, after you no longer have to read it. Some of you will go back and reread it, and you'll say, wow, I didn't realize that this was there. That was me about 15 years ago. Um, <coughs> that was actually Anselm himself. If you read what he says, about in, in the uh, the introduction to the Prologium, he says that he wrote another book before this, right, called the Monologium, and that book was a whole bunch of arguments. And if you read it, it is it's, it's got like sixty odd chapters. I forget exactly how many, and it's all about God and you know the nature of God and you know how the Son proceeds from the Father. No, the Son is generated from the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from both, and what that means and Etc., 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 you know, all this, this theological stuff. It's very complicated and all that. Anselm wanted to try to find one single simple argument that could do all of that stuff and not require any other, any other arguments or, or assumptions in order to, to prove itself. And so he started thinking about this. How many of you read the, the introduction? Anybody read it yet? When you get done here, read the introduction. Because what he says is, I thought about it, and then I, I didn't think I could do it. And like you know, everybody else, when Anselm didn't think he could do it, what did, what did he do? What do you do when you don't think you can do something? Yeah, he gave up. He said, this is a waste of time. I could be spending my time on other stuff. Um, this is actually a distraction. Then you know what happened? What happens when you try not to think about something? Like right now, nobody think about um, Barack Obama singing the national anthem. Don't think about it. Everybody's not thinking about that? What's actually going through your mind? You've got some image of Barack Obama maybe standing somewhere, maybe he's singing, maybe he isn't, right? If you try not to think about something, it often impresses itself on you. This argument did that to Anselm. It did it so much that he actually thought that it was the devil trying to make him waste his time and be a bad monk. Uh, and he sort of like forbade himself to think about it. And then one day he had a, a breakthrough, and suddenly he saw what it is that we're going to be looking at in just a couple of minutes. And, again, if you read through that introduction, he doesn't say, I saw that this would be a really great way to convince people who don't believe that God exists, that God does exist. What he said is, it filled me with such joy, this argument, that I thought I would write it down so I could communicate that to others. Now, you know, I don't know if any of you experienced joy reading this. I certainly didn't the first, you know, two, three even, you know, like 20 times. If you stick with it, though, and this goes for any philosophical work, this also goes for any great novel, 
any great historical piece, if you stick with it, you will in fact come to, come to enjoy it. You will get joy from it. You will get pleasure from it. And that's, what's, that's what Anselm is trying to uh, bring across. So let's look at what he, what he actually says. So we're only going to look at, <coughs> excuse me, we're only going to look at three chapters today. Chapters two through four of the Prosologia. And the reason that we're doing that is because those are the chapters where this, what gets called the ontological argument for God's existence are, are found. Is that everything that's going on in the Prosologium? No. And we're going to talk about more of the stuff that's going on in the Prosologium next class session. But this class session we're going to try to wrap our heads around a very tricky proof, um, which you may find completely convincing, uh, even though you don't want to, which has been my experience sometimes. Uh, or you may find completely baffling uh, at first. And then as you start to understand it, you may say, this, this still doesn't make any sense. Or you may say, oh, now I get it. Um, you may think there's some sort of sleight of hand, you know, like a magician pulling the rabbit out of the hat going on with this. Because it almost seems like just out of the idea of God, Anselm manages to pull God. Pretty good magic trick. So let's see how he actually uh, does it. Um, he starts out, we're going to ignore all the prayer stuff, because he is actually you know, talking to God while he's, while he's claiming to prove God's existence. That's kind of strange too, isn't it? You know? Um, you can tell he believes that God exists. So he says, um, I'm going to kind of change the language. So, does God exist? We believe that God is, is something than which nothing greater can be thought. So this is one of the key terms. That, than, which, nothing greater can be thought. And actually, before we go on, let's think about this a little bit. What does that mean? Let's think of some examples. So, think of Barack Obama singing the national anthem again. Um, is Barack Obama a great singer? Anyone ever heard him sing? He could be, yeah. Maybe he opens his mouth and he sounds like Pavarotti or something. Um, probably not going to be the case, though. Can you think of anything greater than Barack Obama when it comes to singing? I'm willing to bet you can think of all sorts of things that are greater. All sorts of singers who are better singers, right? Um, can you think of anything bigger than Barack Obama? Physically. Are there any people bigger than him? Sure. Like in size? Yeah. There, there are a lot of people, I guess. Sure. And now, let's say we keep, you know, stacking them up and we go to the next person. You know, and we say, this person's really big. Let's say we actually find that the tallest person in the world right now. Could you think of somebody being bigger than them? Yeah, just watch some science fiction stuff, right? Think of like a, a you know... Uh, some hormone that makes people get bigger. So if the biggest guy in the world is currently eight feet tall, which I don't know, maybe that's the case, maybe not. Um, can you imagine somebody bigger than that? Sure, you can imagine somebody nine feet tall, right? If somebody um, is very wise, like who do you consider particularly wise? particularly intelligent. Anybody uh, offhand that you can think of? No, I mean, don't say like somebody like my dad, or because we don't know your dad. And anybody public that you can think of who's really super smart. Well, I'll use an example. Um, a girl I, I, I actually... Uh, went to high school, or to, to middle school with, who became a, a person who, uh, you know, does stuff with NASA. Um, 
Well, she was pretty smart. She's probably smarter than me. She was working for NASA. They put her in charge of things. Can I think of anybody smarter? Sure. Stephen Hawking, right? The guy in the wheelchair who does all the physics stuff and comes out with books every so often. Could there be anybody smarter than him? Sure, we can think of somebody smarter than him. Uh, does Stephen Hawking know about mathematics? Sure. Does he know about um, all the possible different ice cream flavors? Probably not. So somebody who knew about not just all the mathematics that you could think of, but also ice cream flavors, they would be smarter, wouldn't they? You see how this works, right? So for most things that you can think of, you can think of something greater than that thing, can't you? What about numbers? Can you think of the greatest number? Think of the biggest number you can think of. Now I add one to it. You, you've just now thought of a, a greater number, right? So pick any attribute or any quality that you like. It seems like for most things, you can think of something that's greater, can't you? Think of the best time you ever had in your life. The, the best experience you, you've had so far. Can you, think of any, can you think of anything that you could add to that experience that would make it even better? Like you went to this concert and you're, you know, you're there with all your friends and the weather was just perfect and it was the band that you always wanted to see and you never did get to see and um, you, what else can we add to this? You, um, you won a contest so you got to eat and drink everything that you wanted from the concession stand and somebody in the band saw you and got, gave you, you know, backstage passes, not just for you, but for all your friends. And um, could you add anything more to that? Sounds pretty good. I'm sure all of you can think of other things you could add to that, right? What else might you add to something? You won another contest, and you walked out of there with a thousand bucks in your pocket. That would make it even better, wouldn't it? They audit, the band autographed your shirt, which now you're never going to wash. We can, we can keep coming up with all of these sorts of things. Now think about like a, a really good person. What, what qualities would they have? What are you looking for? What do you look for in a, in a potential mate or in a, a friend? I think they're nice. They're Being well. nice, yeah. You don't want people who are mean to you, right? That's pretty baseline, though. What, let's 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 really raise the bar as high as we can. What else? Um, someone who's trustworthy. Trustworthy. That's that's great. What else? How about good looking? Anybody want you know a mate that's good looking? Or are you all like, you know, so far beyond appearances <laughs> uh, that that doesn't matter to you at all? Let's just throw that in. What else? Yeah. Oh, you weren't raising your hand? You could, you could think of all sorts of different qualities. But no matter what qualities you think of, you could probably think of it being a bit better, adding another quality. This is one reason why people often get dissatisfied too, isn't it? Because you can imagine all sorts of things. Could there be something <coughs> that you couldn't think anything better or anything greater than? That's what we're working with here. You know, when, when people talk about God, we have all different sorts of ideas of God, right? What are, what are some of the ideas that people have of God that are not very attractive that you've encountered in your life? How about God as the guy in the sky who's got a long white beard and he's got a whole set of rules and if you violate his rules, he's going to get you.
What do you think? Is it a very attractive picture of God? Could you think of anything better than that? <clears throat> what could you think of that's better than that? How about a God who gives you second chances? And, and you know, when you do the wrong thing, and then he says, I don't want you to do that. The next time I'm going to get you. But this time I'm going to let you off so that you can try to fix things. Wouldn't that be better? How many of you would prefer that, that God to, to strike a dead God? Quite, yeah. And then we, could we think about more and more things? So those are probably not very good pictures of God. Right? What do people mean when they say, God, what do religious believers mean when they're talking about God? Well, Anselm says this is one of the things that they often mean. <clears throat> something than which nothing greater can be thought. If you could think of something greater, that other greater thing would be God. So, you know, let's say God exists, and God made everything, but there's something that controls God. Well, we wouldn't call God God then. We'd call that thing that controls God. Because that would be greater than God. If there's something that we're going to worship and say is, you know, the highest, we really want it to be the highest, don't we? Um, so, God is something than which nothing greater can be thought. Now, if you just say something like that, does that mean everybody automatically believes in God? No. No. Anselm says there's, there's this, you know, um, passage in the Bible where the Bible talks about people not believing in God. The Bible has this figure of the fool, and if you look in the wisdom literature, where wisdom is the opposite of foolishness, one of the things that makes a fool a fool is thinking there's no God and then behaving like there is no God. So, you know, screwing people over, cheating, lying, stealing, and saying, hey, it doesn't matter, there's no God to do anything to me. I can do anything I like. So I'm going to, you know, abuse the, the weak and take advantage of people. That's, that's what the biblical fool does. In Anselm's case, the fool just says, there is no God. So if you say to the fool, if you say it to somebody who's, who's an unbeliever, we're going to get rid of the term the fool now because it's kind of derogatory, right? So we're just going to say somebody who doesn't believe in God. Somebody who doesn't believe in God can at least understand this this. Uh, phrase, right? That than which nothing greater can be thought. And they can understand that um, God, at least to the religious believer, is that than which nothing greater can be thought. But what does the what does the non-believer say? They say there isn't any such thing. That's just an idea. And where's the idea? Where do you keep your ideas? Not in your pockets, right? I'm going to keep my car keys in my pockets. You know, but no ideas there. Pens. Things like that. Um, where do you keep your ideas? In your head. Yeah. Or as my daughter say in your noggin. You know? uh, and that's kind of a metaphor, right? I mean, are your, I suppose if you think that, that your brain is, is your whole mind, then that's it, right? So your ideas are literally there in your head. But what do we mean by that? In your, in your mind, in your, or as Anselm says, in your understanding. Just an idea in your mind. Um, now notice, at this point, the, the, the non-believer has the idea of God in their mind too, don't they? They, they think that it's just in their mind though, right? It doesn't exist in reality. Just in the mind. So everybody, everybody's followed along so far, right? So what do we have so far? 
God is, is that than which nothing greater can be thought, among other things. Um, when people are talking about God, they just have this idea in their head. There's nothing actually out there in reality corresponding to that idea. It's just an idea that you have in your head. And as soon as you start thinking about it, you've got it in your head, in your mind, in your understanding. Um, so you have the idea of that then which nothing greater can be thought in your mind. So does Anselm's fool. So does Anselm himself. So do I. So does whoever's watching this this uh, video, right? Uh, maybe 30 years from now when you guys are all, you know, at the mid-stage of your career, somebody might be watching this. And as soon as they hear that phrase, that then which nothing greater can be thought, they have it in their mind. Um, now, could this be the case? Let's assume this actually is the case, Anselm says. Let's say that all this stuff that religious believers say about God exists, and you know, he's a mighty God, and you know, blah, 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 that's all BS. That's all just imaginary stuff that they made up, and they tell themselves stories to make themselves feel good. Whatever story you like about, about that sort of thing, um, that's what's going on. So we're going to assume something like that. We're going to assume it, and we're going to see if that really works. And if it doesn't work, then what has to be the case? Let's say we assume that God doesn't exist in reality, but there's a contradiction that we end up in. What does that mean then? Well, let's think about other similar cases. You get in a fight with your best friend. And your best friend says that they've been completely loyal to you, and you say, well, okay, I'm going to assume that you are completely loyal to me, but then this would follow, and this would follow, but that's a contradiction. That can't actually be the case. What conclusion do you draw? You do this sort of thinking all the time. Maybe your friend's not completely loyal to you. Because you assumed that they were, and some sort of contradiction arose. Something that couldn't be the case. That must mean that they, the opposite is true, right? So if we can show that if we assume this, some sort of contradiction arises, this has to be false. What would that mean? That would mean God has to exist. So let's see if that can be done. Anselm says, okay, there isn't any such thing. It's just an idea in your head. It exists in your understanding, as he says. Um, he introduces another thing. He says, it is greater to exist in reality than just in the understanding or in the, the mind. <clears throat> Imagine your, well, it doesn't even have to be your perfect uh, mate or perfect meal or perfect whatever you like. Or what, what you're going to do after you get out of here. What are you guys going to do when you get You're all going to go back and just read Anselm, right? No. <laughs> Some of you at least are honest enough to shake your heads. What are you going to do? Eat, right. That, I, I hope most of you are going to dinner, right? Um, now, does anybody know what's on the menu for dinner tonight at the, the cafeteria? Mafia? What's that? Somebody? Let's say it's lasagna. Right? Since we don't know. Imagine the lasagna. <clears throat> that lasagna now exists in your mind, doesn't it? Imagine all the, the wonderful qualities that lasagna has. Um, what do you like about lasagna? Does everybody here like lasagna? Is anybody here who doesn't like lasagna? And, okay, then this works. What do you like about lasagna? Cheesy. 
What's that? It's cheesy. It's cheesy. There's that and, and that texture, you know, when it's just the right temperature. What else about it? I, I love lasagna. What do you guys like about it? Just the cheese. Nothing else? Why not just eat a, bun, uh, you know, a bunch of cheese then? Yeah. Presumably the noodles play some role as well, you know, in the sauce, maybe the meat or whatever they put in that filling. Okay, so you've got that, you're imagining that in your mind, right? Now eat that. Everybody full? Everybody <coughs> satisfied? Did you enjoy the taste of it? It's going to be better to have that real lasagna, isn't it? Real lasagna is, is greater. Lasagna that exists in reality <coughs> is greater than lasagna that just exists in your head. Or, you know, let's, let's use an example that actually Kant brought up. Here's $20, right? This is a $20 bill. It's a real thing. Um, where does this spend most of its time? In my wallet, in my pocket. This could be yours. It already is inside your head. Right? Because you're looking at it. Now you have this, this image in your mind, don't you? I don't need to give you $20 then. You've got $20 already. Right? Isn't that just as good? Or is it greater to exist in reality as real $20 than to just be an imagined $20? A thought $20. Even one dollar, right? Um, okay, so all of you get this, right? It, it's greater to exist in, in reality than just to, to exist in your mind. Does anybody see any problems with that? Everybody agrees with it? Okay, so let's think now about the idea of God. There's no such idea in reality as that than which nothing greater can be thought. So... Can you think of anything greater than this idea in your mind of that then which nothing greater can be thought? What if that then which nothing greater can be thought actually existed in reality? Are you, are you thinking of that right now? Well, where is it existing then? Where is that idea? In your mind, right? Because you're thinking of it? So, if that than which nothing greater can be thought doesn't exist in reality, and you can think of something greater than it, is it really that than which nothing greater can be thought? Let's go through that one more time, because it's kind of tricky. So, God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. God doesn't exist in reality, just, just as an idea. But it's better to exist in reality, it's greater to exist in reality, than it is just to exist in, in the mind as an idea. You can think of that, right? So you can imagine something which is that, that which nothing greater can be thought, existing in reality. That doesn't mean that it actually exists in reality yet. But you can imagine it. And if you can imagine that, you have now thought of something greater than what nobody was supposed to be able to think something greater than. That's a contradiction, isn't it? You have that than which nothing greater can be thought being something that something can be thought greater. It's sort of like saying two is not equal to two. Or ice cream is not the same thing as the stuff made out, what is ice cream made out of milk and kelp and, you know, flavors and things like that. There's a contradiction. So, remember what we said about it there being a contradiction. What was going to happen if there was a contradiction? You remember back about ten minutes ago? What was going to happen if, if, there, if, if we assumed this and there was a contradiction? What were we going to say? Somebody's got it. Say it. It's okay. 
this has to be false. So if, if, if it's false that there isn't any such thing, what's the opposite of that? There is such a thing. That than which nothing greater can be thought does exist, not just in your mind, but in reality. It's kind of tricky, isn't it? This is one that you got to read through a couple times and sort of wrap your head around in order to make sense of it. And I still, myself, to this day, and I, I'm a person who actually finds this convincing, I still go through moments where I say, this can't possibly be true. There's got to be something wrong going on here. And I, and I used to be on the other side where I was, where I was saying, this can't possibly uh, be true. Um, I can't believe this. And yet it was sort of, you know, pulling at me and saying, yeah, Maybe it could be. Maybe there is some logic there. And I wavered back and forth. So, so if you're wavering back and forth, that's okay. Um, Anselm, I think, would probably understand that perfectly well. He talks as if this is going to convince you automatically like that. I'm guessing that your experience as we've gone through this has not been that you had an aha moment where you said, Oh, God exists. Great. All of my theological worries were solved. Did anyone, did anyone in here have that, that moment? If you stick with it, you may actually have a moment like that. It may not be a lasting moment. Bertrand Russell had a moment like that, uh, and then later on sort of recanted. But it is an interesting argument. Look at the way that it works. You assume something to be the case in order to prove that that can't be the case, so that something else must be the case. You assume that God doesn't exist, in order to show that some sort of contradiction arises so that therefore God must exist. Tricky way of doing it, isn't it? That's not like, you know, doing a proof in geometry or, um, you know, about angles or um, proving to somebody that, that, that Colonel Mustard did indeed kill the person in the, in the parlor with the, the candlestick. Um, it's not really that kind of proof, is it? Um, so, if that's perfectly clear to you all, then we'll go on to chapter 3. If it's not clear, then, then tell me, what, what doesn't make sense? And, and don't be shy about it. It would be perfectly understandable to me if some of this were to seem fishy to you. Is there anything in here that seems fishy to anybody? What do you think? Wait, yeah. I'm just a little confused. Did we decide that there, it does exist or it doesn't exist? Because we crossed good it question. out, but then we didn't cross it out. So we, we decided that this sentence, there isn't any such thing, the thing that the, the right. non-believer said, there isn't any, any such thing as God, it's just an idea in your head, it has to be false, because it led to uh, contradictory conclusions. So what has to be true is the opposite of it, which is that God does exist. Um, good. It's important to be clear about these things. Um, anything else that seems a little fishy in here to you? Not everybody accepted this proof. As a matter of fact, one of uh, Anselm's fellow monks raised some problems with uh, it's not in the reading selection that we have, but if you if you go on the same website that the reading selections were coming from, Jasper Hopkins' uh, website, the the uh, reply by Ganillo on behalf of the fool, Ganillo didn't accept it, and then Anselm replied back to him, um, saying, "Well, you should accept it," and gave some reasons why. Well, think about this, and then actually next Monday when we take this up again, if any of you can find a problem with. Bring it up, and, and we'll, we'll go over it. Or if there's something in it that's not clear to you, some, some part where you didn't see why we made the transition that we did, bring it up, because I want you to be able to, I, I'm, not, I'm not so interested in whether you agree with it or not. I don't, I don't care whether you believe in God or don't believe in God, or find this convincing or don't find it convincing. I, wanna, I want to find out whether you understand it. 
And this is a difficult proof to understand, I think, um, on a deep level, not on a surface level. Well, let's look then at what we have left of class at chapter 3 and chapter 4. So, now we know God exists. And Anselm goes a little bit farther. And he says, um, actually, God can't be thought not to exist. That's the, the title of chapter 3. Pretty, pretty provocative. He says, um, this being exists so truly, it, re it cannot even be thought not to exist. So again, if you have that than which nothing greater can be thought, and that's God. Um, let's say that you want to take the side of the fool. And you say, wait a second, just five minutes ago, we were saying there was at least one person who thought that, that God didn't exist. Right? We, we, just one chapter ago. Um, he says, if you could think that this doesn't exist, then that than which a greater cannot be thought would not be that than which a greater cannot be thought. Um, now how, how is that happening? Okay, so let's let's start out with this. God is that then which nothing greater can be thought. God can be thought not to exist. And at this point we say, even though he does, right? I mean there's all sorts of things that, that exist that you may not know about, right? Or you could think aren't the case. Like, uh, what's in this? Uh, what's in this cup? Anybody know exactly what's in this cup? Take a guess. What's that? Coffee. Coffee of some sort, yeah. But what coffee exactly? Hazelnut. It's not hazelnut. <laughs> And now, you know, um, you could think that there's hazelnut in there, even though there isn't, right? Um, or maybe I'm lying to you. Maybe now you don't think that, that, that hazelnut coffee exists in this cup, even though it does. You can think it, though, right? We can have a debate about it. You, you know, if you want to resolve it, you open it up and smell it. No, nope, no hazelnut. And now you fixed it. With God, does everybody believe God exists? There's some people, right, that don't believe God exists. Presumably, they can actually think that God doesn't exist because they're saying it. So, how can Anselm possibly be saying that God cannot be thought not to exist? Well, let's look at this logic. So, we assume this. God can be thought not to exist. So, that, than which... Nothing greater can be thought. Can be thought not to exist. Okay. Everybody, no problem with that, right? All we did is change the terms a little bit. So we're like, you know, substituting in a... In a a variable in an, in an equation. Um, is it greater to be the kind of being that can't be thought not to exist? Is it greater than being the kind of being that could not exist? It's kind of, <coughs> kind of tricky to wrap your head around, so I'm going to say this one more time. Try, try to think through this. Two kinds of beings. Beings that, that could not exist, like you and me, I, I didn't have to exist, neither did you. Uh, the reason why you exist is your mom and dad, some night, got together, 
and you know, did their thing, nature took its course, egg got fertilized, your mom carried you to term, uh, and then a bunch of other things happened and you wound up here at Marist, right? Um, same thing with me. Did my mom and dad have to get together? Maybe my mom could have uh, hooked up with somebody else. Maybe your mom could have. Maybe your dad could have. We're what we call contingent beings. We don't have to exist. <coughs> what about what about you know this iPhone? Five years ago, this thing didn't exist. Did it have to exist? Was there anything in the nature of things that said an iPhone must come into existence? Uh, when did iPhones first get invented? Um, Five years back, maybe ten years back, the prototypes, I don't know. What about this wallet? Does it have to exist? Not even the leather that, that it, it consists in has to exist. That came from some cow. Did that cow have to exist? Could add a whole bunch of other cows in its place. This leather could have been used for something else. Did it have to be put together in this way? No. So these are all contingent things. Could anything be such that it has to exist? Can you think of something, the kind of thing where it would have to exist? Can you at least have that thought in your head? Okay, so we agree then that um, uh, things that cannot be thought, not to exist, are greater than things that can be to exist. Now, you all remember the, where we went last argument. What's going to happen after this? If you're thinking that God or that than which nothing greater can be thought, can be thought not to exist, then you can actually think of something greater than that, can't you? Namely, something that can't be thought not to exist. So that than which nothing greater can be thought, you just thought of something greater than it. Which again generates what? A, what do we call it? Dilemma. Not a dilemma. A, it starts with a C. Contradiction. And if we have a contradiction, we have to reject the thing that started the contradiction. So God can be thought not to exist. We have to change one letter there. Two, can't, right? So God cannot even be thought not to exist. Who knew? Right? Did you start out today thinking that you would find out that, that uh, not only must there be a God, that you can't even not think that that God exists? Doesn't that seem a little fishy again? So, you know, the argument seems pretty good, though, doesn't it? Have you found, has anybody found any weak points in the argument yet? Yeah? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, you can argue all you want, but I mean, unless you have, like, physical proof, you can't really full-on prove that there is a God. Well, you wouldn't have physical proof of God, right? Because, by assumption, God isn't a physical thing. You can have physical proof of water freezing, because water is a physical thing. Um, it's kind of interesting, you know, when the, we were in this arms race with the Soviets, right? And the Soviets were atheists. And they got, a, they got into space ahead of us. And just to sort of stick it to us, because, you know, in the United States, most people were Christians, one of the cosmonauts was, like, looking around in space, and he said, I don't see any angels up here, therefore God doesn't exist. Well, that doesn't actually solve anything, does it? Because it, it's not that sort of thing. The kind of 
the, the line that you're taking is a line that's similar to what Thomas Aquinas, who we're going to look at next week, would, would say. You have to have some other way of proving it. Just, just talking about it isn't going to, to do it. Because what this looks like is that we start with an idea in our head, and we just sort of stick inside of our head and think about stuff, and boom, there's God out there somehow. Now, there's, there's two ways to think of that. Yeah, and this is where I'm actually going to, um, to end. Let's say, just for the sake of assumption, that all this stuff is actually valid and the ontological argument does hold and all that. What's actually going on? This is where we get to the sort of the, the metaphysics part and not just the philosophy of religion part. So here's, this is not a very good drawing, but so here's you, right? Uh, Here's your thought bubble, right? And um, I'm not going to try to write that then, which nothing greater can exist in here. I'm just going to call that God, right? You've got God in your thought. And if the ontological argument actually works, this may be part of what you feel is, is kind of off about it. It kind of looks like we didn't have God existing beforehand, because it was up for dispute, right? And because you happened to manage to think about God in a certain way, boom, there's God necessarily existing in such a way that nobody can ever think that he doesn't exist anymore, according to Anselm. Now, if that was the case, something would be happening that he says um, shouldn't happen. Um, this is in chapter 3. So I'm going to read you a little bit of this. He says, If any mind could think of something better than you, the creature, what does he say, would rise above the creator and would sit in judgment over the creator. Something which is utterly absurd. If God could be the sort of thing that we could inject into reality, by just our thinking about it, that would mean we would actually be greater than God, right? If God comes from us, if we put it a different way, if God comes into being because we think of God, that would mean we'd be like God's creator, wouldn't, wouldn't we? Do you think that's what Anselm has in mind? Probably wouldn't make sense for for a committed Christian monk to think of things that way. What if instead it's something more like this? God exists in reality, and because God exists in reality, 